Hi, welcome back to Lipid Biosynthesis on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous videos, we actually saw how the cell synthesizes new fatty acids, and it was really through a mechanism of a complicated enzyme called fatty acid synthase. Well, Regardless where we get the fatty acids, whether, whether it's from de novo biosynthesis or just from the diet or liberated from adipose tissue, we have to have a way to build more complex lipids. And the two that we're going to look at in the next few videos are going to be phospholipids, of which the simplest one is called phosphatidic acid or phosphatidate, and triacylglycerols, also called triglycerides. Usually when you go to the doctor, they measure your, your triglycerides. That's the same thing as a triacylglycerol. And let's just do a little bit of review of the structures of these. This is a phospholipid up here, okay? Uh, the simplest one being phosphatidic acid. So both phospholipids and triglycerides, they both have a glycerol backbone. Here's the three carbons of the glycerol. Each one of those carbons has an oxygen bound to it. And in a phospholipid, such as this one, two of those oxygens are esterified to fatty acyl chains. Um, sometimes they call these the tails of the phospholipid, and there's always two of them in a phospholipid. The third uh, oxygen is actually bound to a phosphate, and this oxygen right here where my mouse is, in the case of phosphatidic acid, it just has a hydrogen on it. But in other phospholipids that are the more common ones that we'll see in membranes, this hydrogen will be replaced with something called a head group. And we're going to look at the synthesis of those phospholipids in the next video. And it's going to be a little bit complicated because to put different head groups on there, like choline or ethanolamine or serine, it's going to require a different short metabolic pathway. But this is the basic structure of a phospholipid. Triglycerides still have the glycerol backbone, but instead of having a phosphate on this third oxygen over here, rather they actually have three fatty acids esterified to each of those oxygens of the glycerol backbone. And one thing I just want to make clear about this that's very important to consider is that in, this, in these pictures, I'm looking at them and all the fatty acids in each of these have the same number of carbons. I'm not going to count them, but um, these two are the same number of carbons in each chain. There is no requirement that that has to be the case. For example, one of these could be a 14 carbon chain, which would be a meristoyl group. And the second one could be a 20 carbon chain, which would be an arachidinoyl group. Okay, so there's no requirement that these have to be the same two fatty acids. Okay, same thing with the triglyceride. These can all be different. In fact, even some of them can be saturated and some can be unsaturated. With phospholipids, it really just depends on where the phospholipid is going. Is it going to the mitochondrial membranes or the ER membrane or the plasma membrane? They have different compositions um, and different requirements at different temperatures and, and so on and so forth. Okay. So just to review a little bit of that, now let's actually get into the synthetic pathway. And the first thing we're going to need to do is synthesize something called glycerol 3-phosphate. Um, in general, we don't synthesize just straight glycerol. We have to synthesize it with the phosphate attached to that 3 position. And this is really what I consider to be the ultimate parent of both phospholipids and triglycerides. And in general, the major source of it is from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is an intermediate in glycolysis. If you go back and review the glycolytic pathway, about halfway through the pathway, we end up producing glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. It's actually the product of aldolase, one of the two products. And what we can do is we can siphon this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate out of glycolysis and reduce the aldehyde group into an alcohol. And that's catalyzed by this enzyme called glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Um, notice this is a different enzyme than the one in glycolysis, which is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. But in any case, the aldehyde group gets converted to an alcohol, and now we actually have glycerol 3-phosphate. As far as I know, this uh, pathway for getting this, this enzyme is the major source of the glycerol 3-phosphate. It's from glycolysis. We can have minor trace amounts of glycerol that are floating around that are leftovers from uh, triglyceride and phospholipid degradation, and this glycerol can actually be uh, phosphorylated to make glycerol 3-phosphate by glycerol kinase. But the major source is through glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So now we actually have the parent 
uh, to all the triglycerides and, and, and phospholipids, and that's because this is the backbone. It makes sense to make the backbone first, and now what we're going to do is actually transfer the fatty acid tails, which are acyl groups, onto the glycerol uh, backbone. These are catalyzed by enzymes called acyl transferases. Now, what the acyl transferase will do in a stepwise fashion, as you can see, it's going to require a couple steps, is it's one at a time going to transfer these acyl groups onto uh, the glycerol and esterify them. And the acyl groups ultimately come from acyl CoA's. If you go back and review, probably in a beta oxidation playlist or in a textbook, you'll find an enzyme called fatty acyl CoA synthetase. Um, it's synthetase. Synthase is different. But fatty acyl CoA synthetase, or ACS, you can see it actually exists in the ER membrane and the outer membrane of the mitochondria. It's considered a cytosolic enzyme most of the time because it's actually catalyzing the reaction in the cytosol, um, but it's localized to each membrane. But it takes the fatty acid and converts it into an acyl CoA, which is a more solubilized, active, or activated fatty acid. And so the acyl CoA's are going to be used by the acyl transferase to transfer the acyl groups onto the glycerol. And so the first reaction of the acyl transferase on glycerol 3-phosphate puts the acyl group on the first position, and that's going to give us a, mole a general molecule called 1-acyl glycerol 3-phosphate. Now, when, by denoting this acyl, we're just being general. Okay, It could be any acyl group. It could be a palmetto wheel group, 16 carbons. It could be uh, it could be a, a 14 carbon group, so Murista wheel. It could be anything. Okay, this is just general, and so this is we're going to have a wide variety of one acyl glycerol three phosphates because we have a wide variety of acyl groups. We're then going to do the same thing a second time, same enzyme acyl transferase, but it's actually going to put the the acyl group on the two position now. Um, so now we're going to have what's called phosphatidic acid. So instead of calling it 1,2-diacylglycerol-3-phosphate, which you can do, the common name is phosphatidic acid, and it looks something like this. Again, these fatty acid tails can be different lengths, but this is just a general phosphatidic acid. Okay. Notice it's got the phosphate on the 3 position and two esterified fatty groups right there. All right, so phosphatidic acid, this is going to become important, is a branch point in complex lipid metabolism because we can either go to phospholipids, uh, which we're actually going to cover in the next video, or we can actually go straight to triglycerides, which is a much simpler pathway, and that's what we're actually going to cover here. So we've got our first thing synthesized, phosphatidic acid. Now let's go for triglycerides. Now triglycerides, if you look at the structure, this is a general structure. Again, these fatty acids don't have to be the same length but it doesn't have a phosphate. So it would make sense that we're gonna remove that phosphate from phosphatidic acid, and that's gonna be catalyzed by an enzyme called phosphatidic acid phosphatase. That's gonna remove this phosphate from the three position and give us this molecule, which is called a diacylglycerol or DAG. Again, with DAG or diacylglycerol, Again, these fatty acids can be different lengths, but notice that instead of the phosphate on the three position, now it's just a simple OH group. So then the DAG is going to react with another acyl transferase. Um, this one is specific for diacylglycerols, and all it does is it uses the same mechanism as these other two acyl transferases, and it puts a third acyl group on the diacylglycerol, which would make a triacyl glycerol, sometimes abbreviated as a TAG, a T-A-G, instead of D-A-G. So triacyl glycerols are sometimes commonly referred to as triglycerides. Okay. Now, the triglycerides, these are mainly going to be synthesized in adipose tissue, in adipocytes, which are fat cells. And remember that fat cells are the cells in the body that do the majority of the storage of, of, of fatty acids as triglycerides. Um, this is just a more efficient way to store them than just simple fatty acids. But there are some other types of cells that can store smaller amounts of triglycerides. A good example is type 1 muscle fibers. Um, if you're just doing this for straight biochemistry, you may not have a lot of uh, exposure to that. But there, for mu skeletal muscle cells, there are different types of muscle fibers that have different capacities for metabolism. Some of them, like type 2 muscle fibers, are more uh, uh, have a higher capacity to metabolize uh, sugars like glycogen and just glucose in general and creatine. 
Uh, others like type 1 muscle fibers can actually store some of their energy as triglycerides and they're going to be much better at doing beta oxidation for metabolism. So, but the majority of this is actually stored in the adipocytes. Okay? Phospholipid synthesis is going to mainly occur in the ER membrane. Um, there's a couple of steps that you can see here that can also occur in uh, the mitochondrial outer membrane and these are really just the uh, the acyl transferases. Um, they have specific names. Here's a GPAT and then also an AAT. These are just different acyl transferases. But notice they, they occur in both the ER membrane and the outer mitochondrial membrane as seen in the picture. But once you get to phosphatidic acid PA, really the majority of the, the remainder of the synthesis is going to occur in the ER membrane. Okay. And so we're going to look at the processing of phosphatidic acid in the next video to make all of the, or at least most of the common phospholipids. All right, so join us in that video. Now, just a quick recap of what we talked about in this video, and, and hopefully it makes a little bit of an intuitive sense. We have to get the backbone of the phospholipid and triglyceride first. The backbone is, is the most important thing because otherwise there's nothing to esterify the fatty acids onto. And it's going to be in the form of glycerol 3-phosphate, although there is a minor contribution from glycerol, but it has to be phosphorylated first to make this. Once you have the glycerol 3-phosphate, we have two successive acylations by acyl transferases. The first one is really just GPAT. Uh, the second one is AAAT. Uh, they're slightly different, but they're still acyl transferases, and that gives us uh, the parent phospholipid phosphatidic acid. But phosphatidic acid itself is a branch point because it can either continue to phospholipid synthesis, which is what we're going to cover in the next two videos, or it can be processed into triacylglycerols, and these two reactions mostly are, are going to occur in uh, adipose tissue. Or in some type 1 muscle fibers where we can convert phosphatidic acid to DAG, diacylglycerol, and then to triacylglycerols. Okay? But hopefully this gave you a good understanding of the first phase of complex lipid metabolism. And in the next video, as I mentioned, we're actually going to cover uh, phospholipid synthesis. And we're going to actually break this up into two separate videos. We're going to cover the left side of this uh, slide first, and then in the second video after that, We'll cover this stuff over here, and what we'll see is that there's really two different strategies for actually synthesizing phospholipids, and this video that we're going to look at is going to be more focused of human uh, phospholipid metabolism. All right, so please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Hope this helped you. Thank you.